Good morning. It's good to be with you. Some of you I know, some of you I don't. Um, I am, again, as I was introduced, I'm David Williams. I'm the president at Taylor Seminary. And Taylor is no um, newcomer to all of you. you. You have walked with Taylor for a long time. And so when Tyler wrote me and asked if I would come in and speak, he asked me if I would speak on theological hospitality. And because of our relationship with Greenfield, with Taylor's relationship um, over the years, and because we're talking about, he asked me to talk about theological hospitality, I couldn't help but assume that he wanted a bit of an update about what's going on at Taylor. So I will take that responsibility here. So as, as most of you may know, or as many of you may know, Taylor Seminary has partnered with Sioux Falls Seminary in the U.S. and created a educational system that we call Kairos. We now call it Kairos University, in which there are six different schools that have come together to do theological education. And so Taylor is no longer independent in the sense of uh, kind of a standalone school. We are working together. And this idea of theological hospitality is at the very center of, of what we are doing and how we are doing it. And, um, and so I look forward to sharing with you a little bit about that. But so let me, let me tell you a little bit about this journey that, that we have been on. Taylor, as we have joined with Kairos to participate in that, I can tell you that theological education that we were called to do 50 years ago, as we formed to, to do theological education, is exploding in ways that, uh, did I say 50 years ago? It's 80 years ago. My gosh. Yeah. Um, theological education is exploding. We are doing more theological education now than we have ever done. And it is more dispersed and more diffused around Canada and around North America and around the world than it ever has been. We've got 12, again, these numbers change fairly regularly, but we've got approximately 1,200 students. And because we no longer bring students to campuses where this education is centered around the campus because we bring mentors around the students and the mentors are in our churches. Um, we have about 4,000 people directly involved in the theological education of the students. And those people are connected to our churches. And we are so excited about what we have seen God do as we've decentered one location and recentered the educational journey in the life of the church and around the life of the student. Um, we have approximately 120 Canadian students doing theological education with us, but we have students around the world. We do theological education now in four or five different languages on six different continents. As I said earlier, we've got six different schools that have worked with us, and they're not all Baptists. And this is part of the joy, and this is part of the glory that uh, we have, have experienced. Uh, we've got Evangelical Methodist group working with us. We've got a Quaker group. We've got independent groups. Of course, Sioux Falls and Taylor, we are North American Baptists. But not only do we have these different denominational schools, this is even more significant for us. We have over 70 partners who are coming alongside us to shepherd theological education in North America and around the world. Now, to do that diverse of a theological education program, we had to lean into theological hospitality. We had to investigate it and see how might we do this in order to be faithful to who we are 
and yet allow those people who are different than us to be here as well. Of course, that wasn't all that hard for either Sioux Falls or Taylor. Theological hospitality has been at the heart of what we've done when we did all of our education over there on 23rd Ave. You will know that because many of our faculty and our board and our presidents have come from Greenfield, and you know we have always practiced theological hospitality. And at Taylor, we have always had people from a variety of different evangelical traditions, but we have also had people at Taylor from non-evangelical traditions. We've had people at Taylor from the United Church. We've had people from the, the Anglican Church. We have had a, a rich variety of people come and study with us because that's who we are. That's who Taylor always has been. That's how we envision theological education. As we talk about what we're doing with more and more people, it is our commitment to theological hospitality that more often than not attracts them. Because they all recognize we live in a world that is extremely polarized, very inhospitable where it's hard to be in relationship and to have any type of serious conversation or engagement with people with whom you seriously disagree about things. Theological hospitality has drawn students to us and has drawn partners to us. We believe we were some of the... (laughs) What, what Greg and I, Greg, uh, Greg Henson is the president at Sioux Falls, and what Greg and I say when we talk about theological hospitality is that we could only do this journey because we are Baptists, because we are who we have been formed to be as North American Baptists, deeply committed to the Baptist theological tradition. So if others want to come and join and participate in that, sounds good to us because they're getting formed in the community where we can be faithful to who we are as Baptists, and yet we can be with them. Theological hospitality is so important today because of the world that we live in, but you won't find that phrase in the scripture. Scriptures simply talk about hospitality talks about welcoming, talks about including others. And so when we think about theological hospitality, we have to think about it in terms of Scripture's call to us to be hospitable people, to be a welcoming people. And thus, that's why I've selected today's passage, because we are at the heart of one of the most controversial theological issues in the early church, And that guides us as we have thought about this journey of kairos, of how to do theological education in a theologically hospitable way. If you have your Bibles, you could turn to Romans 14, because we're centering this in Paul's teaching around what some have called the, the the Jewish Gentile schism or the the, the tension between Jewish believers and Gentile believers. Now, Romans is Paul's, probably Paul's most theologically rich letter, and it is written to address this issue in a significant way given what was going on in in Rome with the Christians. But the passage that I'm talking about today comes towards the end of it, and many people will talk about Romans 12 as being, you know, where Paul says, uh, I beseech you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, and he moves into some application. Often we think about it as the application of what he's been doing in the first 11 chapters And 
I don't know that application gets at that just right because I think what he's been talking about earlier has tons of applications and stuff. What I would like to talk about is that he gets very pointed. He's laid this out. He's laid out what God has been doing. Then he gets, let's get really specific as to what this looks like. And so I invite you again to look at Romans 14 verse, we're going to look at 1 through 7, or 1 through 9. The final verse, sorry, 15 through 15, 7 is welcome one another as Christ welcomed you. This, this is the end of the story. This is the command. Welcome others the way Christ welcomed you. That's the glory. That's Paul's command, when all is said and done about theological hospitality, it's welcome as you have been welcomed. But he lays out in the chapter some things that I think is important, some things that are important for us to attend to. Verse 1. Welcome those who are weak in faith. We just have to stop there. The very first word, the welcome, is at the heart of what we're talking about. Different translations translate this different ways. Sometimes it's accept. Accept those who are weak in faith. Some translate it, receive those who are weak in faith. The idea of welcoming is this idea of inviting them into your space. He's talking to the church, and you may remember the church didn't meet in buildings where we're talking about guarding a door. They met in homes, which was a very intimate setting of all of the people coming together. And so to welcome them into this, it's more than just let them come in. It's welcome them into the intimacy of your social circle. This isn't a tolerance. This isn't a tolerate people. It isn't just let them go. You see the church wrestling with that, for instance, in James, when it says, you know, uh, when you invite the, the, the rich and the poor and the, the poor come in and you say, okay, you can be here, but sit over there. Paul says, no, no, no. This is, this, something else is going on here. Welcome those. You're bringing them into. It's you are treating them like one of you, not one of them. This is huge, and this is where he starts. Again, as an unfolding of what God has been doing. Welcome those who are weak in faith. Welcome those who are weak in faith. Already, it's a pejorative term. We've already got this distance going on. We've already, in a sense, judged them as saying, oh, these are some inferior sorts of people for one reason or another. And Paul doesn't say who are the strong are or who the weak are. He knows, I think because we all kind of know, that when we read a text like this, we assume the position of privilege. We assume we are the strong ones, and he's telling us to welcome the weak. And I think that's, that's, that's okay for right now, because I think this is at the heart of what he's wanting us to think, that the people you're inviting in aren't pillars. They're people you may have some real disagreements with, and that's what's going to unpack as we go forward. The next part of this, the next part of this verse, we skip over so often, so quickly. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Wait a minute. Often, we will invite the people in so that we can straighten them out. Right? It's really easy to justify bringing people into our group so long as we're doing it kind of with this strategy to fix them. Paul says, no, that's not 
what this is about. Welcoming is not a strategy. He says, welcome them, but not for the purpose of quarreling with them about your disagreements. And here is the heart of what Paul is trying to get us to understand that is so difficult. And even though this reads straightforward, it's very complicated. Paul's assumption here, we're going to kind of unpack a little bit about what's going on in the church that is this difference that they're being invited in. Paul assumes if you welcome these people and it's not for the purpose of changing them, then they're going to stand with their differences. And you're going to stand with your differences. You're going to have your views. They're going to have their views. And at the end of the day, you're not together to convince each other, but you are together. And this is the fine point Paul is putting on this message of Romans that God's church is a very diverse church. Difference, difference of opinions, difference of judgments, different theologies are a part of this. And we are to welcome one another. Diversity is at the heart of what Paul's doing. Now, if we... If we had time, we could unpack it from the very beginning where, where Paul says Jesus has come as the righteousness of God and what he unpacks through all of that is how Jesus has, came, has, has come to break down the dividing walls that have separated the fundamental division between the peoples in the Jews' mind, between the Jews and the Gentiles. That God is breaking down the divisions that separate us and what we have to do as church is to live into this new unity. But just like them, just like the Jews at first, and us today, it is so easy to say, yes, we have broken down these divisions, but then to recreate them. We break down the division between Jew and Gentile, between rich and poor. And if you read the letters of Paul, you will, or you read the New Testament, you will see over and over this with Paul, this is the struggle, the way in which God has broken down the barrier between Jew and Gentile, but we've reenacted it. We've resurrected it. We Jews, we Gentiles, we build it back up. James was talking about the way in which we build back the division that God has broken down between rich and poor. You bring the rich man into the assembly, you bring the poor man into the assembly, you say, great, you're all here. But then suddenly we pick this up and we say, but the rich person, they get a privileged place. They get to lead. And the poor person... Well, they can be in the room, but they're at the back. Or you think of Corinthians and all the, about the, the cliques and how the, the church wanted to, uh, wanted to follow different leaders and, and create these groups that get privilege and status. See, this is what Paul understood so well. Though Jesus has broken down the barriers between us, making a new humanity, we keep resurrecting them. We keep building them back up. The diversity that Paul is talking about is a diversity that he doesn't expect to change. 
In this way, what I would say is that diversity is not a bug in the system we call church. It's a feature. Diversity isn't a bug. It's a feature. And we've got to resist the temptation to rebuild the walls to separate that which God has brought together. So what does that look like in this context? Some believe in eating, in verse 2, some believe in eating uh, eating anything while the weak eat only vegetables. Sarah May, this is about you. Y'all know she's a vegetarian. Paul says, you're weak, girl. No, no, no. I'm a vegetarian. Well, And every time I come on that verse, I have to kind of cringe a bit. No, that's not what's going on. The point here, some believe in eating vegetables, while the weak, I mean, some believe in eating, eating anything, while the weak only eat vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain do not pass judgment over those who eat. Now we're beginning to see how these walls are getting rebuilt. See, for Paul, it's fine to abstain from eating meat. Maybe weak, but it's fine. You're a part. You have been welcomed in. That's a position perfectly credible. But so is the position that says you should eat meat. So you can eat meat and you can't eat meat. Both positions are fine. What is the problem? Not that there's difference, but that the meat eaters despise. And that's strong language, isn't it? To hold with contempt, to disregard utterly move apart from when you despise someone. See, this is our tendency when we come across people who have discerned a different way of following than we have. And they're both exhibited right here in this passage. The meat eaters despise those who won't eat meat and those who won't eat meat Pass judgment over those who do. Despise. No. Well, this is just eating meat. Why is this such a big deal? Wait a minute. Let's, let's, let's lean back into this. He, doesn't, he only talks about meat eating and not eating, meat eating and vegetables. But from 1 Corinthians, we know that this meat eating was tied to something much bigger because wasn't the Jews didn't care about eating meat. The Jews weren't vegetarian. But they were in this context. How did they become vegetarian? Because you couldn't eat meat in Rome that wasn't offered to an idol. Again, these are Christians. These are Christian Jews who now are followers of Jesus And they ask themselves, can we eat meat? But these meats are offered to idols. And eating the meat offered to idols is the way you participate in worship. This is what the priests do. They eat the meat. This is what the congregants, as they worship, they they eat the meat. Eating meat is a way of participating in the worship of the idols of Rome. And doesn't that violate our fundamental commitment that Jesus is Lord? Jews said, yes, it does. See, this isn't about breaking a dietary law. This isn't about them wanting to eat shrimp, clams. This is meat. There's nothing wrong in scriptures with eating meat. This isn't really about meat. This is about participating in idolatry. And eating meat is participating in idolatry to the Jews. But to the Gentiles, 
Not so much. Not so much. Get over it. Not such a big deal. But it didn't stay there. It intensified. Why? Because then you begin to rebuild this. Well, wait a minute. And the vegetarians passed judgment on those who ate, and the meat eaters despised those. What's Paul's problem? Inherently within the church, we're going to make different discernments as to what is best about following Jesus. How do we do this best? Paul is trying to help us see some can say you can do this and others can say you cannot do this and that's okay. Maybe. What's the criteria? How do we know? We know that despising a fellow Christian is not loving them. We know that passing judgment, this is what really gets Paul's ire, because he spends the last of the rest of 14 and the most of all the rest of 15 talking about passing judgment on those who disagree with you. But the, the problem isn't that they were different. The problem was the way they responded to those people who were different. And But what is it? Those who, Paul goes on to say, those who pass judgment, look what you're doing when you pass judgment on someone else. You're putting yourself in the place of God. You are, you are acting as if you are their Lord and judging them. Notice, he's not saying making a making a discernment or making a judgment in the sense of, I think this is right or this is wrong, that's fine. You can think it's okay to eat. You can think it's okay not to eat. The problem here isn't the discernment. The problem is this taking the place of God this wagging your finger from on high, this moralizing about you are a bad person, you have done this wrong. Don't put yourself in the place of God. Who are you to pass judgment on this servant of another? It is before their own Lord that they will stand or fall. The Lord will either support them in this judgment that they've made or will discipline them, tear them down in this. Like the song we sang, our God is a consuming fire. We can trust God to correct God's people. Don't you try to do that. Who are you to judge? Rather, because it's the Lord who does it, we stand and we wait and we watch and we see what does this discernment look like as it is lived out. That's what Paul seems to be asking us to do. But again, like I said earlier, what is the criteria? What, is, what, what do we use? Paul moves on. For some judge one day better than others, while others judge all days to be alike. This is the second part of this. It's not just about food offered to idols. It's also about feast days and Sabbaths. And this is the whole system of the way the, the Jewish believers were integrating into following Jesus. And there were these huge differences as to what that looks like, how to follow Jesus. Here's what Paul says. Some judge one day better than others. Others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Here's the heart of it. Let everyone be fully convinced in your own mind. It's not just good enough for him to say it once. He says it again in verse 22. We didn't read it. But he says, be sure that your conviction before God, this is your responsibility. The faith that you have... As your own conviction before God, blessed are you who have no reason to condemn themselves because of what they approve. 
This is the heart, and this is the heart of the Baptist distinctive. This is what we always called soul liberty. We said that what Paul is trying to teach us is that we have a responsibility to discern these things, and they may be different. But so long as we are firmly convinced, yes, we know, that means there may be a lot of different things going on, but the criteria that Paul uses is that we are firmly convinced. Being fully convinced in your own mind. That's not enough. He doesn't stop there. That's way too easy to turn into everyone does what is right in their own eyes. Here's the real kicker. Each time he talks about it, not only are they to be fully convinced, but those who, those who honor one day honor the Lord. And those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord. Nobody lives their lives for themselves. They're living their lives for Jesus, for the Christ, for the Lord. So yes, it's firmly convinced that what I am doing is the way of following Jesus and bringing honor and glory to God. Those two pieces are essential. in Paul's understanding of what it looks like in the church to be the people of God. What does this diversity look like? It's going to be, <laughs> Paul was dealing with this. As, as God began to work in the Gentiles, the way in what it looked like to follow God looked so differently than it did when it came through Judaism. We are continuing to see that diversity work itself out. But here are the criteria. Tremendous freedom. Be fully convinced in your own mind that this is the way the Spirit of God is leading you to honor and serve God. Those two pieces come together to be the criteria through which we welcome. Well, what are we to do if we were to respond to Paul's command to welcome one another? Notice it's not make sure everyone does the same things, makes the same judgments. But we have a responsibility to respond to each other. As he is calling us in, the, in this sense, sense of welcome. As Baptists, we have championed the freedom and the liberty that comes through being fully convinced. But I want to suggest as much as that is a privilege that I think is essential to us, it's also a responsibility. That is, what Paul has said is, you will stand or rise according to the Lord. The, you are serving God. God is the one who will correct and change and convict. He's already told us that in John, this, the role of the Spirit. God will do that, but you also have a responsibility to be firmly convicted. This is one of our biggest struggles. It's too often, we really don't know what we believe. We're not firmly convinced of things. We're just saying things we have always said. And so as important as the freedom 
to follow the dictates of your own conscience and be convicted before God that this is right, there is a responsibility there to know the scriptures, to know theology, to know the church, church history, to know how God has worked in the past, to know what God is doing in your time, in your place. There are responsibilities for that. The second response we might make is to learn to trust God with the journeys of other people. I've often said one of our cardinal sins is wanting to be the Holy Spirit in people's lives. See, we can often see what's wrong with somebody else that needs fixing. In fact, more often than not, it's easy to see what's wrong with somebody else. Of course, Jesus leaned into that a bit in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, when you see what's wrong with somebody else, take the log out of your own eye first. What Paul's inviting us to do is trust God loves that person as much as you do. Trust that God is concerned about that person's decision as much as you are. Trust that God has as much invested in that person becoming formed in the likeness of Jesus as you do. And wait and see. Learn to be patient. Learn to listen to what God is doing in the lives of people. Learn to hear what God is trying to say in the lives of other people. What I've outlined is a difficult task. And it's at the heart of how we are trying to negotiate our theological differences, the kairos. We're Baptist. We've got multitude of different denominations who see things profoundly different than we do. But in a context in which we can say, you are followers of Jesus and you are trying to discern what God wants you to do and be, then you can participate in this journey. And we will walk with you. We've got folks that work with us in denominations where their denominations won't work together. One of our groups is a Lutheran group. We've got several Lutheran groups, and some of the Lutheran groups will not work with each other, but they will work with us. And some of the most exciting things that we have seen as we've tried to embody this community that says, if you are following Jesus, if you are fully convinced in your own mind that this is the way to follow Jesus and that's the desire that you have, then come and be a part. We have found that God continues to help convince people of the truthfulness of what he's doing. For example, I teach an ethics class. Well, we had a, we, we had a gathering in which we had uh, different uh, views of baptism, and we had the Baptists, and we had the Lutherans, and we had the Methodists, and we had the Pentecostals, and... Um, had a student in my class afterwards who came up and she said, I'm Lutheran, but I totally disagreed with our Lutheran. And it would have been so easy for me to say, because what she was doing was actually laying out a very Baptistic understanding of, of, uh, of baptism. Um, it had been very easy for me to say, yeah, come on over here. Let's be one of us now. I said, what you should do is go talk to the presenter 
about that. Ask your questions. Explore your concerns. A couple of months later, I ran into her, and she said, I'm, I'm not convinced, but now I know why Lutherans say what they do. And I'm a better Lutheran for that. See, I think in a world of theological hospitality, where we can recognize that people of good faith following Jesus as the best they can in a community that will love them and guide them and pray for them and listen to them and watch for what God is doing is a place where God works in dramatic ways. And this is the community that the world needs so desperately. We have theological diversity, we have political, we've got Anglicans and we've got breakaway Anglicans because of the argument over same-sex marriage. We've got United Methodists and we have breakaway United Methodists. We have tremendous diversity in here, but we're watching people be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ as they are taking their own journey to greater faithfulness. Theological hospitality is simply welcoming others the way we were welcomed for God's glory. I wonder who it is that came to mind as I have spoken that God might be inviting you to welcome that perhaps you've despised. Or perhaps you have passed judgment on. I don't know who that might be. I don't know what God might be doing. But the journey of theological hospitality has been one of the richest and most transformative journeys in my life as I have learned to trust God more deeply and to follow God more, follow Jesus more faithfully. And my prayer is that will be your journey as well. Thank you for listening. God bless.